the genuine article. Discussion and commentary based on articles from Jack. Hello, I'm Tony DeMaria with uh, an edition of what has now become Inside Jack, uh, used to be the genuine article. And I'm talking today with Dr. Matthew Rowe, and Dr. Rowe is Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University and a, a member of the Duke Clinical Research uh, Institute. And he is the first author on a very important paper that we're publishing in Jack that deals with a contemporary look at how we're actually treating patients with coronary disease in terms of both acute coronary syndromes and, and PCI. Uh, so Matt, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about uh, how you gathered this data, where it came from, and what you were looking at. We uh, utilized uh, the two uh, registries from the National Cardiovascular Data Registry at the ACC, the Action Registry to get with the guidelines to profile acute MI care, and the CAS PCI Registry to profile PCI care over the past uh, uh, four to five years. And we used data from the registries and these have been submitted by hundreds of hospitals across the United States performing these procedures and those caring for acute MI patients in an effort to provide a contemporary description of acute MI care and PCI care across the United States. Yeah, so that an advantage was that you had this very large registry, huge registry. I guess a limitation was that the registry was voluntary, and, and uh, so there may have been some uh, uh, bias in terms of who participated. That's true. The, the CAS PCI registry over the five-year time period increased from about 400 hospitals to almost 1,000, so you saw pretty good uptake in that registry. The, the action registry to get with the guidelines, however, only had about 250 hospitals, which again was voluntary. But they are, you know, mostly full-service hospitals that provide a large amount of acute MI care in the U.S. So it's at least a snapshot of what what's happening currently in our country. So, what were the outstanding trends you saw, for instance, in ACS in in either STEMI or non-STEMI? Well, what we saw in acute MI care was that um, a, a, a remarkable increase in the use of reperfusion therapy for STEMI patients who were eligible, a decrease in the number of patients who had a contraindication to reperfusion therapy, and much faster reperfusion times, including door-to-balloon times for patients undergoing primary PCI. And then what we saw in both STEMI and non-STEMI patients was a shifting pattern of use of anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapies, increasing use of direct thrombin inhibitors, decreasing use of intravenous uh, antiplatelet agents, and uh, overall, however, better guidelines adherence for recommended therapies both during the acute care period and the discharge period for both type of MI patients. Yeah, I was interested to see that the actually the total number of MIs that, that you had enrolled actually increased over the study period where there's been a sense in some quarters, I think, that the number of MIs nationally has been going down. Yeah, I think, you know, that it's hard to say, again, with only 250 hospitals, but I don't see a decreasing proportion of MI patients. I see a shift that you're seeing perhaps more patients with non-STEMI and fewer with STEMI. But in my patients are still prevalent. We're showing that in the registry data, and I think they still are important ones to consider. And uh, I think it might be stable or just slightly increasing, but I don't, I don't see evidence of a decrease. In terms of, of PCI, I was interested to see that the complexity of the procedures has increased, but nevertheless the, the results ha have improved. What we saw was that the, the lesion complexity and, and characteristics of the lesions treated were, were more complex over this time period. You saw um, patients giving uh, different use of PCI in terms of newer drug eluting stents being utilized, changing in the use of peri-PCI medications, but actually stable rates of in-hospital mortality, which were quite low, declining rates of vascular and bleeding complications to indicate that operators are improving their techniques and utilizing new technologies and new uh, medications to actually make the procedure safer despite higher complexity. So I, I guess I had two impressions from the paper, Matt. One was that in general the performance of physicians in hospitals uh, is, is actually improving. This is, is very encouraging to look at the fact that more guidelines appropriate care is being given and, and the results are improving thereby. 
And the second impression was that these are really valuable feedback data, that physicians getting this feedback, as I understand quarterly, can really take steps to, to improve their performance. I think you're exactly right. We're very pleased to show improvements in care through this process of continuous quality improvement that the registries are promoting. We think it's very important across the United States, and we, d we demonstrate that that actually changes practice, improves guidelines adherence. And so we'd like, we'd like to see more hospitals participate, especially in the voluntary registries. We'd like to see this become commonplace, and we hope that the future um, guidelines committees can actually utilize these data to help fine-tune future guideline recommendations as well. Well, this, this is really important work. It's, it's showing how we can enhance quality in cardiology. These data will be an important baseline to follow as we go forward and see how care changes. Thanks very much for being with us. For Inside Jack, I'm Tony DeMaria. The Genuine Article. Discussion and commentary based on articles from Jack.